because we do have multiple introductions today. Um, this, this show that you see that's all around you is on view through December 17th, um, Hispaniola, Celebration of Haiti in the Dominican Republic. And it started with, um, well, it started years and years ago, but really this particular show started three years ago um, with a conversation with Dr. Lutz, who's here this evening, um, after I had met with Dion Kohler, who's one of the collectors who's whose work is, um, whose, whose collection is shown in Rubin. And, uh, and Dr. Lutz uh, mentioned the Crossroads course to me. And uh, he said, if you will expand this to the entire island, then we can tie it to this Crossroads course. And that was kind of a wonderful moment, pivotal moment. And the two of us um, worked together, and his course informed what I was doing. And I think, a, I don't know, a little bit vice versa. <laughs> um, it was a, kind of a wonderful synergy. So one thing that I would like to do is introduce um, Bill Shropshire, who is on our uh, advisory board at the museum, who wanted to say a few words to you before we proceed. Thank you, Thank you, uh, I am on the advisory board, uh, which is, um, consists of some faculty members, some uh, students, and some uh, members of the public. Um, they're supposed to have on a badge. I see Jay had, I've lost my badge. But, uh, <laughs> We, we uh, meet uh, several times a year to be a sounding board for Elizabeth and on occasion give some advice. Uh, and one, one of our duties is to, uh, to welcome people to the museum. And accordingly, I, I welcome you. Hope you will uh, uh, enjoy this, this show and come back many times. If, you're, if you are a member, uh, continue being a member. If you're not, uh, talk to one of us with a badge. If, Jay or Elizabeth about becoming a member. Please enjoy this uh, lecture and this show and uh, future events at the museum. Again, welcome to the museum. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shropshire was um, provost. He was also a longtime professor here and is also on our board of trustees. So listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful family. Um, so I just mentioned the Crossroads course. We have several students who are in that course. This is an amazing team taught course that um, Professor Lutz and Mario Chandler, Dr. Chandler, um, team teach every couple of years, and this is the 10th anniversary of teaching it. Um, so it's French and Spanish crossroads of the Caribbean and Africa. And we have a student who's going to introduce our speaker tonight, and let me see if I can get her name right, Annabelle Remroop, who is a senior and a Spanish major and is in the course. Is going to introduce our lecturer. Good evening, everyone. It is the honor of Oglethorpe University and Oglethorpe University Museum of Art to welcome Dr. Mike J. Michael Bash to visit us. Um, he has achieved both his bachelor's and PhDs, in fact, in the University of West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. He was also awarded the UWI Award for Excellence in Research, Senior Fulbright Hayes Award, and the Senior Fulbright Research Award. He is a current uh, acting professor in NYU, New York University, in departments of French and Social and Cultural Analysis. He has many publications under his name, a few of which are titled Haiti in the United States, Literature and Ideology in Haiti, and The Other America, Caribbean Literature in a New World Context. In 2012, he had an interview with the public archive titled Detours and Distance. He spoke about the enduring legacy of his former friend and French writer, poet, philosopher, and literary critic, Edouard Nissan, whose work, Monsieur Toussaint, a play from 2005, he had translated. Nissan was one of the most influential figures in Caribbean thought and cultural commentary. Dr. Dash also spoke about the Haitian post-January 2010 7.0 earthquake and subsequent aftershocks. He characterized the transition of Haiti from a predatory state after the first U.S. occupation to a neo-colonial state after the fall of the Duvalier Dynasty in 1986. Now he will present to us a lecture 
a drop of tears, the seismic shifts, and Haitian, Haitian imaginary. Once more, please welcome Dr. Dash. <laughs> so much. She's a fellow Trinidadian, so <laughs> this is a lot of interesting coincidence here. So thank you all for coming, especially the students who resisted the bright lights of Atlanta on a Friday evening <laughs> to come to a talk. Um, so, so today's talk is called A Drought of Tears, Seismic Shifts and the Haitian Imaginary. Um, and what I'm going to do is, I'm not an art critic, but I've got increasingly interested in art largely because of my work on Edouard Glissant, who has theorized art in some really very original and I think sort of path-breaking ways. And um, what I'm going to do is take you through, in my own way, seismic shifts, those massive crises in Haiti, um, which will form, as it were, uh, kind of a short history lesson in bits, because the art is not, you know, um, doesn't exist in a void. But the, the key part is the Haitian imaginary. Haitian imaginary. And the word imaginary, I suspect we took it from French, because it's the word imaginaire. Um, it's not imagination, it's the imaginary, which is a collective vision that a group would have or a community might have. And um, this is where I'm really being very speculative, where I'm su suggesting that the Haitian imaginary should be seen essentially as part of a sort of diasporic aesthetic. That is, the capacity of artists in the diaspora to continuously keep us off balance. It's one of the remarkable things about art um, uh, from elsewhere in the Caribbean, modern artists from the US, uh, Afro-Caribbean artists in England, etc. that they keep you always off balance. So the, the trouble with Haitian art is that we keep saying it's magical. <laughs> but if you keep saying it's magical, you don't see the extent to which what the artist could be doing is destabilizing us. So that's the sort of general idea and I'll take you through uh, the slides, which, which will be coming up at, at various points. So the, the topic, the title, sorry, is called A Drought of Tears. And this came from the New York Times. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll read the, the piece, a uh, bit of the piece, to um, contextualize the, the term, which, I, which I'd never forgotten when I'd read it. So this is written by Mark Lacey, a New York Times reporter who was in Haiti in, on January the 30th, 2010. And this is a short uh, extract. Amidst all the personal tragedy that has played out here in the two weeks since the earthquake, the earthquake had just taken place, one thing has been in short supply, tears. Sure, I've seen some. A woman whose husband was just, was just behind her when they fled their home that awful afternoon on January the 11th, became misty-eyed when telling me that she managed to get out, but he had not escaped. An artist who had injured both his hands sobbed when he tried to show me the work he had just completed before the quake, and it crumbled into shards when he moved it. Most of the time, though, Haitians I meet have been stone-faced as they recount their harrowing stories displaying the same blank stare I have witnessed on faces in other parts of the world where struggling never stops. Of course, it's no wonderful thing that Haitians have been through so much hardship in the past, natural and man-made, that they have become extraordinarily skilled at shutting down their emotions and switching into survival mode. This is a country, if ever there was one, that needs to sob and bawl and soak the damaged earth with tears. So that's Mark Lacey, and that's my title. Um, and in a sense, it's a response to Lacey. Um, because Lacey, Lacey doesn't know the whole story. And of course, the, you would expect him to say, why aren't they crying? You know, why aren't they um, sort of hysterically breaking down because of what has happened? So Haiti was in ruins 
when Mark Lacey got there in the aftermath of the earth earthquake of Tuesday, January the 12th, 2010. With the harrowing images in the media, what the harrowing images in the media dramatized was nothing new, however, to the vast majority of the Haitian nation. They had lived this way for more than two centuries. Lacey wrote poignantly in the New York Times of the puzzling drought of tears after a tragedy in which Haitians died in jaw-dropping num numbers, that's his expression, their bodies burned in mass graves, dumped in ravines, or simply left to rot in the rubble. He sadly concluded that these, his words, stone-faced people with their blank stares had become, he said, so toughened by their harsh, by their harsh lives that they were so used to living that they were so used to living that they had bottled up their emotions. They had become toughened because the earthquake was just the latest tragedy for a country now impossible to dissociate from the epithet, epi, epithet poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. There was a drought of tears for the uncounted dead in, that lay in the waters between Haiti and Florida. For those who were cut down while waiting to, in line to vote, or those who were massacred since 1986 because they opposed one military junta or another. And the list goes on. Lacey was right to look beyond the tragedy of January 12th for an explanation for the pervasive stoicism he thought he encountered. He encountered. Acts of nature, whether hurricane, landslide, or earthquake, can inflict terrible suffering because of human failures. Yet his tragedy is not so much natural as man-made, not destiny, but history. But what to make of this tearless stoicism that Lacey encountered? How do Haitians inhabit this world imaginatively? So that's the challenge I have given myself. So the first, it's kind of broken down into four sections. First section is called Beginnings. Again and again, we read about Haiti starting anew. James Leyburn in the Haitian people, 1941, felt that in 1804, that Haitians had the opportunity to invent, I quote Leyburn, an entire new little world. The second independence of Haiti, as it was called, after the end of the American occupation in 1934, was also seen by Zora Neale Hurston in Tell My Horse, 1938, as creating stability for, she says, the next hundred years. We should not forget, however, that Haiti was also in ruins on the morning after the Declaration of Independence on January the 1st, 1804, and completely unreformed after the Marines left in 1934. We've become so accustomed to associating images of decolonization with state sovereignty that we tend to emphasize the victory of 1804 over Europe's most powerful powerful army at the time, and forget that the Haitian Revolution was not initially a war of independence. In the early years of the revolution, before Napoleon's rise to power in France, the slaves fought for freedom in alliance with French revolutionary authority, thereby defeating the colonists of Saint-Domingue, who were resisting revolutionary change, hence the term Black Jacobins. Of course, the counter-revolution in France and the rise of Napoleon will change all of this. Only after the kidnap kidnapping and imprisonment of Toussaint in 1803 did the project of transforming colonial Saint-Domingue and defeating the power of the plantocracy turn into a war of national independence. The possibility of a post-colonial transatlantic relationship between Republican France and a non-European culture taking shape at the end of the 18th century lost out to a racial settling of debts as Dessalines set out to give as good as he got. To this extent, to this extent Haiti certainly has spectacularly singular begin beginnings. And indeed, Michel Rolf Trouillot, the Haitian-American anthropologist, described the revolution as unthinkable I'm just quoting here from uh, uh, Trouillot. The unthinkable is that which one cannot conceive within the range of possible alternatives. 
that which perverts all answers because it defies the terms under which the questions are phrased. In that sense, the Haitian Revolution was unthinkable in its time. It challenged the very framework within which proponents and opponents had examined race, colonialism, and slavery in the Americas. Furthermore, it was not guided by any intellectual theory or ideological discourse. The Haitian Revolution was unscripted. But, my question is, what could not be conceived, what could not be theorized, could it be imagined? And here we turn to our first, so if I get this right, slide. Right. So here is a painting of the Haitian flag. So you, as most of you or some of you might know, the Haitian flag was created from Dessalines taking the white band out of the French flag and putting the red and the blue together. So there you have Dessalines taking the, the, um, uh, the, the white man out of, his, out, of the, out of the French flag uh, in Gonaïve, and um, the woman in, in the right hand side, uh, what was she, his niece or something like that? Anyway, she was supposed to sew it together, so she's sewing the two bits together. Okay, so what you have there is a, an illustration of a moment in Haitian history? My answer is no, you do not. It looks like that, but look carefully at the soldiers. What are they? They all look like they have fish eyes. Why, who are these fish men who are participating in this historic event? Well, here's a possible answer. The Haitian Revolution was an, was an African revolution because the large majority of slaves in Haiti were in fact African. They were, had not been creolized, there have been so many slaves being brought into the country that you had a large proportion of the slave population which didn't even see themselves as slaves, they saw themselves as captives, which meant that immediately the possibility of revolt would have been um, you know, very probable. So these are Atlantic Africans. So what he has given us are the fishmen, the crossing, the, 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 the idea of, um, of, of, of a, an, as if it were kind of a new people, a new species that emerges at this historical moment. And you look hard to see Haiti, but it seems to be completely extraterritorial. You know, it, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to want to specify Haiti, but it seems to want to specify more the idea of ghosts. Ghosts and fish and the whole scene one could possibly imagine is not only outside of time and space, but it seems to be underwater. It seems to be underwater as well. Um, so what are we looking at? Is this simply a representation of a historical moment um, in, in, uh, after the Haitian Revolution? Or are we looking at Afro-modernism? Are we looking at a way in which um, an aesthetic now, um, uh, which is very much part of what I would call diasporic art making, is before our eyes? Um, so, so keep this picture in mind because we're going to kind of come back to it later on. Um, notice the tree in the middle. Um, uh, he may be cutting the white out of the French flag, but that tree is the tree of liberty, which goes back to the French Revolution. So the tree of liberty is planted or replanted in Haiti. Well, we're not even sure planted because those roots seem, if anything, to be floating at the bottom. Okay, so here it is the first example of what I would see as being the kind of um, uh, destabilizing quality that um, one finds in what I would see more broadly as a kind of Afro-modernist practice, practice, and that is, I would say, alive and well in this painting by Madson, Madson Mon Premier. So let's go on with our history lesson. In the aftermath of independence, Haiti had to contend with a world of white slave-owning states. 
among them some of the most powerful nations in Europe. The price paid for national independence was therefore punishment. This took the form of massive indemnities paid to France in exchange for recognizing Haitian independence. Recognition by the US did not come until 1862, and the Vatican until 1860. The refusal of the Catholic Church to establish a diocese in Haiti was not only a problem in the international arena, but made a formal education system provided by missionaries impossible within Haiti. Haiti's legitimacy was questioned again and again in the aftermath of national independence. Recognition of the supposedly illegitimate nation, Haiti, by its former colonial masters meant only dependence meant only dependence with a massive indemnity paid to France by borrowing the money, of course, from French banks. The US attitude of ostracism to Haiti also meant that many European countries saw Haiti as less than a state whose existence was to be recognized or respected. Haiti's territorial waters were constantly violated in the 19th century. This was especially the case with the interference of German gunboats as a number of German merchants grew significantly in Haiti in the second half of the 20th century. In the 19th century, Haiti was essentially a neo-colony. Without, without the assistance of any of those bastions of the post-colonial post order, the United Nations, the World Bank, and the IMF. Well, I mean, their, their assistance is sometimes questionable, but still, if you became independent in the 1960s, you had all of these institutions which could in many ways help or protect or support your, um, your autonomy. Against this back, backdrop of neocolonialism and ostracism, Haitian society began to take shape. Haiti may be unique in the Caribbean in that its society cannot be fully understood without addressing the terrible asymmetry of economic power that exists in that country. If Haitian society cannot move forward and cannot realize the dream of modernity that sparked its revolution at the end of the 18th century, it is because it was paralyzed by a workforce that could not be coerced into productivity and a bourgeoisie that lived by siphoning off the country's productivity to support its personal consumption. Haiti was a nation divided, so much so that James Laban, who I quoted earlier, called it a caste society. The bulk of Haiti's population is rural, agricultural, made up of small-scale landowners and increasingly the landless. It was as isolated from the bourgeoisie as Haiti was cut off from the outside world. Wealth was pumped out of this peasantry by an elite who saw them, to use the, the, the Creole expression, as moon on the eau, which means people on the outside. And they were to all intents and purposes voiceless and invisible. Haiti might again, also again be unique in creating such an extensive peasant society in the Americas. Traditionally, what is called the peasant class in Haiti does not function as one. Sidney Mintz once observed, the anthropologist Sidney Mintz who worked on Haiti, that the peasant class in Haiti was, and he cited Marx in saying this, was organized in the same way that a sack of potatoes was organized. They were politically inactive, attempting, if anything, to avoid the state and its representatives from whom they expected little but taxation and harassment. One of the most repeated state sayings in Haiti to this day, I think, is après bon Dieu, c'est l'État. After God, it's the state. So mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the state remains a kind of supreme arbiter of what happens to you. Through, Haitian, through Haiti's political, sorry, though Haiti's political culture was marked by militarism, violence, and, in, and instability, rural Haiti remained relatively stable for more than a century after independence. We must nevertheless be wary of romanticizing Haitian peasant isolation and cultural retent, re, retention. The case can be made for a complex and evolving idea of the Haitian, of Haitian peasant culture, particularly one that is shaped by contact and migration. The myth of the Haitian peasantry as a repository for ancestral African practices is dear to the hearts of many intent on seeing the Haitian peasant simply in terms of an ancestral past. Culture is not destiny, and the Haitian peasantry has been inevitably transformed by history and politics, especially since the US intervention of 1915 
as American neo-imperialism in the early 20th century produced migratory movements in the Northern Caribbean. Consequently, Haitian rural culture is not merely the product of a unique Haitian space, but rather is shaped by more global and cosmopolitan forces. The experience of the Haitian masses includes urbanization, migration, and an increasing global consciousness. The peasantry was catapult catapulted into modernity by an American occupation under Woodrow Wilson, which lasted 19 years, and it meant that Haiti entered the U.S. sphere of influence and has not left it since. The U.S. Marines disembarked to secure American business interests and to limit Franco-German influence in the region. The occupation of Haiti should, have been, should, have, should be seen in the context of Woodrow Wilson's overseas imperial adventures at this time. Though each intervention had its own character and purpose, they form a pattern of gunboat diplomacy in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic. So this takes us to our second seismic shift, the occupation, and I begin the cartoon. Sorry. Oh, the cartoon. Go back to that. Um, so this is a cartoon from the Mar Marine Archives, um, which supposedly describes the, um, the U.S. occupation. But well, you can see the gunboat on the left. Um, but you find, curiously, the Haitians, who are obviously the ones that are, you know, like the bandits who need to be uh, pacified, they're all wearing sombreros. Um, and what you have written on the ground is Haitian republics. So there's a kind of pulling together of Cuba, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Veracruz, it's all the same thing, so I mean, and there's your American, American Marine, of course he's larger than everyone else, in the, in the, in the pose of, um, of the discoverer, is it? I mean, you should, Christopher Columbus is usually positioned like this, with a gun, and he says, listen son, do unto, do unto your brothers what you have them do unto you, savvy? Anyway, so it, it's funny, and so on, but it does tell you a whole lot, like the lot cartoons do, about the, 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 the state of mind and the attitude to this um, occupation. So, the occupation. The US occupation marked the beginning of a paternalistic American attitude to Haiti, which continued to be seen as an orphan country. So, you know, lack of legitimacy in the 19th century, now an orphan country in need of external adult guidance. So there's your adult, <laughs> your adult marine, and you know, with the kids running around with, with their points. Officially, Haiti and the US were not at war. Therefore, the U.S. Admission, admission in Haiti was essentially one of paternal guidance, whose main goals were political stability, strategic control of the Northern Caribbean, and modernizing the Haitian economy. While this occupation was a mere footnote in the history of the U.S. in the 20th century, people have forgotten this occupation, actually. <laughs> it was a disturbingly crucial event in modern Haitian history. However well-intentioned the occupation may have been, it was experienced as a form of punitive colonial aggression by the majority of Haitians. The Marines were there as father figures, and when the Haitians rebelled, they needed to be taught a lesson. A key figure in the opening years of the occupation was a man called General Smedley Butler. And here is a quote from Smedley but Butler before a Senate committee investigating the occupation. So the butler said, we were all imbued with the fact that we were trustees of a huge estate that belonged to miners. This was the view I personally took, that the Haitians were our wards, and we were endeavoring to make for them a rich and productive property, to be turned over to them at such a time as our government saw fit. But terrorism as a form of domination masked a ben masked a, as benevolent guidance remains a shaping force in Haiti-U.S. relations. The rhetoric of Haitians as wards of the U.S. has never disappeared, and the image of the collapsed national palace constantly replayed in the media after the, the earthquake of 2010 is a dangerously misleading symbol in this regard. It uncannily reverts to the discourse of the orphan illegitimate nation that is in constant need of fathering. So this is the image that you saw again and again um, on the TV of the collapsed palace, um, which of course is 
supposed to be rebuilt, but the whole thing came, uh, came apart. Um, so uh, 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 an illegitimate, illegitimate orphan nation that is in constant need of fathering. The mercy missions to adopt Haitian children, which were lavishly covered in the US TV, on US media, may have been humanitarian in intent, but they also served to reinforce the old image of a country of minors in need of paternal guidance or foreign saviors. By the time the Marines left Haiti in 1934, Haiti had been transformed all right. The migration of Haitian labor to US-funded plantations in Cuba and the Dominican Republic had begun. Haitians began to consume American commodities, and one person point out, pointed out that Scott tissue and gold medal flour uh, <laughs> were being used in Haiti. Um, even though there's one surprising omission, Haitians never learned to play baseball. <laughs> After 19 years, they never learned to play baseball. Of course, you get baseball players in the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Cuba, so whatever. It's an interesting idea. Um, Haiti's visibility grew in the US as tourism began to flourish in the 1940s. So Haiti opens up and you get a whole lot of tourism as a result of this. Haiti was marketed in terms of an alluring strangeness. Catherine Dunham, Lavinia Williams, Pearl Primus did much to, in, to promote an interest in the songs and dances of Haiti's popular culture. Dunham was known as a dancing, dancing anthropologist, and in 1943, the New York Times reported that in her Haitian spectacles, I quote, Miss Dunham's chief business is to sizzle. She is 100% seductress. The work that, most, that was most influen influential at this time in fixing Haiti in the American imagination is William Seabrook's pseudo-anthropological -anthropo travel book, The Magic Island, published in 1929. So, let me get to that. 1929. So, occupation is 1950 to 1934. 1929, this book comes out. And it's a huge success. Um, in this work, Haiti appears as titillatingly exotic as a result not only of Seabrook's sensationalist prose, but the graphic and grotesque illustrations by Alexander King. So, um, that's one of them, and here's another. Um, so the first time zombies were seen in the US were in 1929, and with this particular illustration by Alexander King. Um, if you get a copy of The Magic Island, you'll see that, um, uh, Seabrook took photographs, but they all collected at the end. The text is um, you know, uh, made lively, as it were, with these uh, bizarre image, uh, images which were drawn by King. Um, King and Seabrook are the two most responsible, the two individuals who are the most responsible for the primitivist commodification of Haiti. If today, the cinema is filled with images of zombies. It all goes back to Seabrook and King, um, who first exploited that Haitian myth. It's quite telling that the first time zombies are observed in Haiti by Seabrook, it is in the cane fields of the Hasco um, uh, plantation. Hasco is a Haitian American sugar company. So Hasco is an American uh, example of American investment in Haiti. And the laborers that were, um, or some of the laborers that were seen by Seabrook were zombies. So, um, as I said, interestingly, the first undead, therefore, were the dehumanized laborers being exploited in the capitalist system in post-occupation Haiti. This is a far cry from the vacant-eyed cadavers who lurch across our movie screens and whose bite is toxic. The 19 years of military domination in Haiti left an indelible mark on the Haitian collective imagination. The image of a country's martyrdom became closely associated with the leader of the guerrilla, guerrilla in insurgency during the early years of the occupation, led by a man called Charles Peralt. The leader of this resistance movement was killed in 1919 by the Marines, 
and his body put on display by, by, um, by the um, US authorities. This iconic image has had a powerful effect on the Haitian imagination. So here is a picture of the body of Perrat. So Perrat was killed in 1919, and this was put up as a lesson to the miners not to oppose the occupation. So there's your, your actual image, and Philomé Aubin does a version of it, and this is what has come off that um, figure. It's Christ crucified. So you have the uh, weeping uh, Virgin Mary, you have um, the associations of martyrdom far more clearly um, inscribed in the, in, the, um, in the painting. So Pirat then becomes the martyred country. In fact, of course, it's completely twisting the original intent of the photograph that you saw earlier on. And later on, we have this. This is a, um, a, a metal piece of metal sculpture done by Nura Briere, um, a series he called The Crucifixion. And what's interesting is um, the way he takes the figure of the martyred Christ and now creates out of, by the way, what he's doing, he's cutting flattened oil drums with the shears. So already you have this um, uh, very banal and ordinary material which is turned into something which uh, is sacred. So it, it, it blurs the, the line between profane and sacred. And look again at the figure. Look at the movement in the figure. Is this a trapeze artist or is it a crucifixion? So I mean, is, is that body twisted in pain? So it remains again with that um, curiously unstable um, uh, uh, dimension that I'm um, stressing, which is not as if it's telling us something, it's inviting us to be part of it. Inviting us to keep asking questions and never getting a, um, a definitive answer as a result. Land of Secrets, third section. The occupation may have brought stability to Haiti for a while. But Haiti had not been modernized in any significant way after 19 years of US military rule. What the occupation did was to firmly establish Haiti as a land of secrets. Secret rituals, secret beliefs, secret life, the secret life of rural Haiti. The discovery of Haitian primitivism in the 1940s further reinforced these stereotypes. This painting by Hector Hippolyte, which I'll show you now, would soon establish both the artist's credentials as an outsider visionary and bring Haitian so-called primitive painting to an international audience. We see again the parent-child dynamic that made Haitian miners and wards in 1915, now insisting on a magical, childlike, and naive quality in authentic Haitian art. So here's a painting. Well, sorry. This is, <laughs> this is the person, I'm going to paint you on now. This is the person who saw the painting and then, um, in a sense, uh, triggered the international uh, success of Haitian naive art. In December of 1945, André Breton, arrived in Haiti from New York to do a series of lectures on the invitation of an old friend, Pierre Mabie, on the right, who was a French cultural attaché in Haiti. During his two month stay in Haiti, he reunited with Wilfred Olam, that he met in Paris, so there's Lam in, in center, with whom, who, with whom he had escaped Vichy, France, arriving on the same boat in Martinique in 1941. Mabi is incredible because Mabi has invited Lam to come to Port-au-Prince to put on an exhibition. You can see some of the work behind there. Um, and uh, uh, Breton arrives at the same time. So you've got this incredible uniting of surrealists in Haiti. In various lectures and interviews, Breton explained that his idea was to align surrealism 
with Haitian peasant culture. In his account of his experience with, with voodoo ritual, he insisted on their clandestine nature and was fascinate, fascinated by the, the mysterious dimension of possession. When Boton saw the painting Adoration à la Sainte Vierge by Hector Hippolyte, there it is, in the Centre d'Art in Port-au-Prince, he immediately for, saw this as a form of automatism and felt the painter must have been possessed while creating this painting. Breton was probably blinded by his atheist beliefs because he seemed completely unaware of the painting's subject, the crowning of the Virgin Mary by 14 angels. He didn't also seem to be interested in the decorative aspects of Hippolyte's work, knowing that the latter painted the facades of various buildings for a living. For Breton, and I'm quoting Breton now, the painting evoked the same sensations as a beautiful sunny day in the country, gently waving grass, sprouting seeds, buttercups, the iridescence of insects' wings, the tiny clashing symbols of the flowering creepers, the clusters of fruit juggled by the season's hands. Furthermore, he said, Hippolyte, I quote, had a message to communicate. He was a guardian of a secret. Breton had no way of knowing whether Hippolyte did in fact have a secret. His knowledge of Creole was non-existence, and he non-existent, and he never even got to the painter's umfo. A lining possession in Haitian voodoo with what he called primitive thought, Breton saw Hippolyte as a medium in whose painting of paintings of voodoo spirits one could find traces of universal esoteric practices. In Hippolyte's painting of Ogun, which Breton owned, he concludes that it is immediately apparent that the rep representation of Ogun is closely akin to that of the juggler in the tarot, pa tarot pack. I'm sorry. So this is the painting of Ogun by uh, Hippolyte, which was in um, uh, Breton's possession. And he says, this in fact, the secret here is the juggler in the tarot pack. So you can see why he said this. <laughs> there are certain similarities between the two. The table, the stick, and so on. But for um, Breton, who became increasingly interested in the occult and, and the esoteric, um, Hippolyte was a painter of the occult. In, in a 1948 interview, Breton claimed to be convinced of the importance of primal forces to the survival of threatened communities. I quote, to a great extent, they resist secular oppression, I think of the Hopi Indians, as well as extreme economic privation, I think of black Haitians in this way. This view of Haitian primitive, uh, of the primitive Haitian painter as an outsider visionary was a, with a secret is still dominant, is still the dominant view of Haitian art. Not surprisingly, Breton's essay on Hippolyte in Surrealism and Painting is placed just before his text on the art of the insane. It's an ironic, in an ironic sense, Breton's vision of Haiti as a land of the occult eventually becomes a reality when Francois Duvalier comes to power in 1957 and based his dictatorial regi regime on the power of the esoteric. Following closely in Breton's footsteps, the French writer and former Minister of Culture, André Malraux, visited Haiti in 1945. It was felt that tourism and commercialization had ruined Haitian painting and had lost its, in its authenticity. Malraux came to Haiti just before he died, so he must have been terminal at the time, to meet with a group of artists who work, whose work were not, works were not commercialized and who had discovered the magically naive quality, or rediscovered, I should say, the magically naive quality of Hippolyte's um, earlier works. In Lent Temporel, 1976, Malraux recounted his meeting with these artists in the mountains, in the mountainous village of Soissons, La Montagne. And here's a photograph of Malraux meeting the painters um, of Soissons, La Montagne. 
Marin was struck by the fact that the paintings of Saint Soleil were in no way connected with reality. They were neither signed nor were they for sale. They were filled with what he called undulating forms that seemed hallucinatory and surreal. Malgro was, Mal Malgro was impressed and pronounced that the paintings had lyrical qualities that reminded him of the late Chagall. Like Breton, he felt that peasant painters were possessed by the voodoo spirits when painting and went so far as to declare that Saint Soleil was the most striking example of the only controlled experiment in magical painting in our century. The irony, of course, of all of this is that after Mar Margot dies in 1976, he's brought all of these painters to international fame. So they begin to sign their works and sell them for a lot of money. <laughs> um, here's one. You got one in the exhibition, actually, yeah. absolutely beautiful one. This one I own. So I said, why don't I put one of my own paintings <laughs> in, the, in the talk? So this is a Prosper Pierre Louis um, painting from, from Saint Soleil. So the final section now, I've been going on for too long, um, the walls talk. By the 1980s, the majority of, of, of um, for the majority of its citizens, Haiti was not the land of the occult but one that had been ruined by 29 years of Duvalier rule. The eventual collapse of Jean-Claude Duvalier's ostentatious presidency in 1986 was directly linked to the consequences of its kleptocratic nature, as well as the increasing politicization of the mass of the Haitian population. Driven by desperation, roused by the message of social justice, spread by the grassroots Catholic Church, or the Tea as it was called, rural Haiti revolted against the seemingly all-powerful Duvalier dictatorship. If you went to Haiti in the 1980s, you'd have been struck by the spray-painted graffiti that de decorated the walls of the decrepit downtown, of the, of decrepit downtown Port-au-Prince. The walls of the city had become a Creole billboard of political slogans and social commentary. In a country of high, of high illiteracy, a popular enthusiasm for the newfound liberties after the fall of the dictatorship meant that political views were disseminated and ventilated on walls in public spaces and not debated in newspapers or in the print media. Now, the first dramatic display of Haitian mural art was, in fact, not political at all, but the paintings in the Holy Trinity Cathedral of Port-au-Prince. In 1949, to celebrate the bicentenary of the city's founding, the Anglican bishop, who was in America actually, invited Haiti's primitive artists to decorate the, church, the church's interior with scenes from the Bible. Their work on the altarpiece was particularly impressive. So here's a, the altarpiece of Holy Trinity. No longer exists, the whole thing collapsed during the earthquake, and very little of it was saved. So this was the altarpiece that was, was done. The forces that brought on the dictatorship did not originate in political organization, but in the grassroots Catholic Church. By 1990, a return to the former status quo could only be thwarted by a populist leader like Jean Bertrand Aristide. His Lavalas movement, Lavalas means uh, um, a rush of water, was a metaphor for sweeping away the old order, order and um, and political co commentary on the walls of the capital reflected this. Pablo Butcher, in Urban Voodoo, his book, captured many of these images of Judgment Day for the Devaluers and the hope of a new political and, and social order in Haiti. So here is a mural from Butcher. So here is Deshukash, which is a, um, um, acts of, of revenge against the Makuts. Um, I'm not burning you, I'm judging you. And necklacing was, was done um, uh, by um, various anti uh crowds in Haiti. And this is a particularly spectacular kind of, uh, as if he's being burnt on a pyre as well as anything else. So, so this is the kind of mural you would see in 1986 um, in Haiti. Um, Aristide represented everything that the ruling classes hated and feared. They struck back. And in a military coup in 1991, ousted Aristide, who was returned to power only after a flood of refugees pushed a reluctant President Clinton to use force in 1994 to reinstate Haiti's free, first freely elected head of state. Ever since then, there's been an endemic crisis in Haiti's political culture. 
the popular anti-devalue movement put the idea of uh, ideal of democratic reform within reach of the previously dispossessed masses. But it also ushered in an economic model that linked democracy with free trade. Consequently, the central paradox that frustrates the post duvalier transition to stable democracy derives from an explosive combination of laissez-faire capitalism on one hand, which favors the elite, um, and democratic elections, which give power to the underprivileged. Um, I want to conclude speculatively with some of the ideas of Edouard Glissant, um, the Martinican writer and theorist, who saw Haitian painting as a kind of writing. The painted symbol, the oral sign, shared for him a kind of repetitive and accumulating multi multiplicity of the real. We can contrast Breton's view of Hippolyte, which we talked about earlier, with Glissant, as the latter is much more concerned as Glissant with rep repetition and multiplicity in Hippolyte's paintings. For Glissant, Hippolyte's aesthetic was one of profusion. Angels, flowers, vines, birds were repeated in ever multiplying movements. Glissant would not only have seen the 14 angels, he would have counted them. His approach to Haitian painting avoided the esoteric and the magical to stress its hieroglyphic capacity to express, to directly express the real. I'm quoting here from my translation of Glissant. It is created, Haitian painting is created on the earth with natural products, flour, starch, so on, on perishable material. That is a form of painting that produces a schematic version of reality, the beginning of all pictography. A pictography that produces a version of the real, the real in our contemporary global moment. And the Haitian imaginary responds to this moment by not asserting ideas of Haitian authenticity or the occult, but by overturning fixed ideas of Haitianness. So, um, provokingly, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the way in which ideas of um, authenticity are overturned. So here's a 1990 um, uh, rendition of uh, Aristide, now linked to Perrault mm -hmm. as being the savior uh, of the nation. So, Ogun Rambo. In Haiti, gods are stars, and they have a thousand faces, and they have every right to appear as Sylvester Stallone. And if you think this was a one off thing, look at this. Back of a tap tap, Rambo again, and that's Ogun. So, immediately says, Oh, you, Ogun, yes, that's the Yoruba god. Well, Something has happened to Ogun in a couple of centuries, and now Ogun is free to um, be incarnated in terms of celebrities, in terms of um, uh, images of virile power, etc., etc. Um, second image, by setting marine gods adrift on a sea of uncertainty, the marine pageants of Duval Carrier tell the tale of divine nomads the continuous circulating um, through an ever multiplying series of middle passages. So Duval, this is a very early Duval Carrier, and it's absolutely beautiful. It's the beauty that draws you in, and you begin to ask yourself, what am I looking at? What am I looking at? So there is your Haitian tree of liberty again, set adrift on a sea in which in the top hat would certainly suggest Baron Samdi. So various figures that are tied to um, uh, uh, voodoo divinities now are nomads. They are not rooted. They are circulating, which of course is, is an absolutely wonderful idea. And in fact, a series of these paintings are called Ombaglo. Ombaglo means Ombadolo, those that are under the water. And one of the more fascinating ideas that comes out of Haitian voodoo is that the gods live under the sea. Um, so there's a, there's a whole marine um, nomadic dimension which has been been um, added in by um, uh, Duval Carey in these, as I said, absolutely lush pageants that he that he paints. Um, and and to end, 
violent acts of appropriation. So here you have an example of, this is, I'm trying to put the artist's name, Andre Eugène doing the Madonna, or is it Erzuli, in which the sacred and the secular clearly collide. Um, what you have there is bricolage. Um, and to me, you should begin with Marcel Duchamp if you try to read this, and don't begin with any sort of esoteric idea, obviously. Um, that the original bits and pieces of a um, uh, uh, car's engine are repurposed in this way to create a figure which, um, in a funny way, still has a sort of dignity of the Madonna, but you also are aware of what it's made of. He doesn't attempt to hide it in any kind of way. So here you have, if anything, what Jana Brazil calls in her recent book, Vodou Bricolage. This art does not explain. It does not offer answers and certainly does not conceal secrets. It triggers visual pleasures that activate uncertainty and disturbs our habits of seeing and thinking. Stoic silence, unshed tears seem poignant, but somehow insignificant in the face of the power of the Haitian visual imaginary. That's it, thank you. I, I'll, I'll, I'll add something. We were chatting about this earlier, and I mentioned Chris O'Fu. Um, I, I finally remembered the other artist that makes me think of Vic Munez, a Brazilian mm -hmm. artist who recently had a wonderful show at the high. Um, but, you know, taking whatever it might be, garbage or peanut butter and jelly or sand or sugar or some kind of average material and using it to create something iconic and beautiful. Yeah, I mean, you could go on for a while on this, because these artists, he's part of a group, mm -hmm. who are called Artists Resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are on, in the main, la rue principale, it's called la rue principale? La Grand Rue, la Grand Rue, which is the main drag, as it were, in Port-au-Prince, the Harbor Road. And they are situated in the section where cars are repaired. That's where you get, you can get your tire change, you can get, so there's, there are car parts everywhere, okay? so. They're creating art at a site where, as it were, all of the waste of modern industrial culture is deposited. So, I mean, so it, it, it makes it even more of a dramatic, as the French would say, détournement de sens, a twisting of meaning, to take things which are the, um, you know, what is shed and what is thrown away from, um, uh, modern industrial culture, and to try to, to construct the sacred from it. It, it, it really is a huge imaginative, um, imaginative leap. Yes. Notion of detour, mm -hmm. um, in the sense that um, there is that counter imaginary to the social construction um, that you talked about, the zombies, about the flag as well. Um, and I was wondering if that process of transformation is more a process of uh, countering or reappropriation of the imaginary. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that they call themselves. Artist resistance. Well, what they're doing is, is reappropriating. So it, it changes resistance into something new. Resistance is not rejecting. They're not saying, oh, we don't want anything to do with the industrial culture. We're going to take it <laughs> and, and, and find new meanings within it. So that's a kind of detour, if anything. It's a detour no more. Um, I think it fits beautifully into any idea of the postmodern because the modern is about binaries, isn't it? It's about inside, outside, for and against. This is the third possibility. You know, where you function in, in, a, in an area where um, 
almost unpredictably, uh, you oppose without negating. You oppose without negating. Um, uh, I don't know if you know the work of Benitez Rojo. Mm -hmm. um, Benitez Rojo with the uh, repeating I learned, he has this one quite uh, uh, poignant scene in it, where he says when he was growing up, um, you had a Cuban Missile Crisis. So the Soviet Union had put these missiles in Cuba, and Kennedy has said if they don't move it, they were going to attack. So the world was poised for nuclear holocaust. Havana had been uh, uh, evacuated, and he said, just at the moment when the apocalypse seemed imminent, he saw two women walk by, um, baskets on their heads. Um, and he said they walked by in such a way that he knew there would be no apocalypse. That is that they, they in a sense, defied this almost kind of macho confrontation between superpowers to find another way of, of managing that reality. And I think that, um, you know, of course he builds his entire argument around this other way, but I think this is another way as well. You know, it, it functions in that zone where it's not about negation, it's about detours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it echoes a little bit about native, native, not native, native heart that you, heart that you were talking about. I, I didn't hear. They said it echoes a little bit what La Naive is doing, right? By um, creating a different meaning to things that already exist. Yes, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And creating them, in a sense, within a space which, um, you don't surrender to the space. <laughs> you, 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 you can't use the word resistance. I mean, they call it an artist resistance. They're resisting, you know, but it's, these, are, these are oppositional maneuvers within the space, mm -hmm. which they are um, almost like kind of guerrilla, urban guerrilla warfare, if you wish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody else wanted to thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering about the, your discussion of the, the Taking the occult and sort of saying it's this sort of primitive, generated thing from sort of the secrets and mysteries of Haiti. Because um, I just, over the summer, read um, Hegel and Haiti, Susan Buckmore's, mm -hmm. and, I, and I remember this the strange section in that being not about you know, Hegel reading about the Haitian Revolution and sort of that informing his philosophy, but that there's this sort of like these are, there are occult symbols circulating in the Atlantic in that moment in. Um, like Masonic orders and all of these kinds of Enlightenment brotherhoods that are creating, like, have these sort of <coughs> matching symbols. And so mm -hmm. I was wondering if, in some way, like, Breton is misreading the occult as this sort of primitive generation, things being generated from the primitive, when actually it's part of this moment of a potentially trans um, Atlantic, transracial imaginary, at, you know, at the moment of the Haitian Revolution that then is collapsed and made into something, you know, that's seen as. as generated only from the primitive, um, not in this kind of revolutionary moment. And I was just thinking about, because I didn't know what to do with those passages in that text, and this made me yeah. think about that. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. And it's one no, of these, I mean, it's one I I, would you take my, I'm going to take my comment and make it into a question. Does that make any sense? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's very interesting. You know, when Brutto went to Haiti, he found out that the founder of the Freemasons had actually died in saint -Domingue. Yeah, I think that's He'd why. Gone, so he kept looking for where he was buried, <laughs> never found it. Uh, but he became more and more obsessed with this idea that myth, mm -hmm. that myth is really, you know, we get to the end of the Second World War, it was myth that would save civilization. So the Hopi um, Indians, for instance, and therefore the Haitian, how do black Haitians survive? Mm -hmm. It's because of this esoteric, uh, mythical world that they in, in, inhabit as a way of, you know, reacting, reacting to, um, reacting to the realities, the harsh realities that they live. Um, but, you know, the reality is that, I mean, yeah, I agree, I mean, there must be a whole lot of different things that are circulating in Haiti as a result of <coughs> Haiti's clearly modernist beginnings. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Haiti is, is a product of the French Enlightenment, in a sense. Um, so that, uh, I, I think that one needs to, in a sense, kind of walk away from the esoteric um, uh, dimension that that Bruto wants to give to this um, to this, uh, to this to these works, um, and and you know maybe in all of this there's an idea of painting that needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. 
Because Bhutto is absolutely convinced of the importance of the visionary artist. And this goes back to the 19th century. The artist is visionary. The artist who then, um, whose work you encounter and you're illuminated by it. So when he sees Césaire, when he meets Césaire in Martinique in 1941, he says, visionary artist, and he's right. Haiti, um, uh, Césaire is a visionary artist because he's constructed in the mold of the voyant, the artist who visions. When he gets to, to Haiti, he's using the same discourse. But what we are looking at, and I think Lisa is right, it's not about visionary anything. It's, it's pictographs. It's the way in which a writing is using the visual to create ever um, sort of ultimately kind of completely ungraspable notions of the real. The fact that he says that Haitian painting starts on the ground. He's talking about voodoo. Uh, images are drawn on the ground, that they are connected to like the surface of the earth. And even when they go onto canvas, it's still that. He, he wants to keep that idea of matter alive. So it's not the vision, it's the encounter with matter, which he privileges. And I think that, that he's onto something there. So what um, Bertok cannot see in Hippolyte is Hippolyte's encounter with matter. And when he's organizing matter in a pictographic fashion, he thinks that he is the vision of a man possessed who is speaking to the world. So I think that there's something there which is um, sort of key to this moment um, in understanding well, Haitian art, but more generally, you know, um, even writing that matter. Um, I mean, Lisa keeps saying that he's not a visionary <laughs> in that sense. Um, yeah. Um, I was struck by the uh, emphasis you put on um, Haitian history mm -hmm. in um, presenting the art, and it's been my own personal experience also that um, I would say uh, Haitian history is well known in Haiti and it's not well known anywhere else. And there are, there are these, um, your, your seismic events here, it's as if it too is in this some kind of floating island uh, that, that no one else, that, that it seems now at different times uh, gets connected in some kind of way. But um, do, you, do you see these artists as being um, as uh, uh, keeping that tradition of being uh, of, of, uh, 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 protecting, keeping the, the memory alive of these seismic events? No. no. I think, I mean, you, I mean, you're right. Haitian occupation. Who remembers the Haitian occupation but Haitians? You know what I mean? Um, the Haitian Revolution, you ask him, oh, well, you know, the slaves got up, they shrunk the French, and, you know, fun. So we all, I mean, there are versions of it which are all in, in truncated and, you know, simplified, etc., etc. Um, no, I think, I think, I mean, my, 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 um, my view is that because of those massive, what I call seismic shifts, I'm of course taking it from the earthquake, yes. Haitians have to work harder. They have to work harder. They have to work harder at inhabiting that space. So I mean, when, you, when we go there, we all have a return ticket. <laughs> so we walk away and so on. Mm -hmm. But if you have to inhabit that space, how do you do it? And so then it goes back to Lacey. Lacey says, you know, what is this? You know, why aren't they letting it all out? Is that right? So I think, so my, my idea would be that if you have to try harder, you put a lot of pressure on the imagination to correct, to, to, to find other ways of managing reality, and the, the reality that you have to, to live through. So that 
um, if there is a thread that puts all of this art together, it is that. It's about imagination and depression. Not to say, I tend to say no to that because I don't want to say, oh, I'm from the Caribbean, therefore I can see. Um, I, even I, in your talk, mm -hmm. you saw, would see uh, you know, the pictogram, whereas Breton would not. He's right. a visionary. But by the time you get to 1945, he has certain kinds of obsessions which, <laughs> which might even have blinded him to, to what he could have possibly seen. Um, no, I think, I think that. Um, I think the Caribbean case is an interesting case. You know, I mean, it's, it's a case of, of what um, uh, early global capitalism can produce you know, in terms of um, genocide, <laughs> in terms of importing people, you know, and things like that. But I think there's a broader, um, uh, what should I say, kind of position or more, more inclusive position that one can take. And this might be it. Again, I'm kind of piggybacking on this on here. Um, there are two ways in which modernity emerges. It can emerge in phases. It can emerge, to use this <laughs> uh, image, in a sedimented way. You know, enlightenment, industrial revolution, you know. But for a lot of people, to use Risa's image, you are precipitated into modernity. You are thrown into it. That means that you don't have the layers, the, the steps. You are thrown into it. It could be the middle passage. I mean, that is one way of being thrown. But it's not the only way. And there are other societies in which people are thrown into it. And I think the throwing is very important. The harder you are thrown, the more you need these imaginative resources to manage where you are going and who you are and what you're going to be. I mean, that is no clear way of understanding these things. Uh, so he makes, of course, in the open boat, um, uh, uh, an extended reflection on what it must be like um, to be among strange people, to be in a vessel where you can't see the show on either side. Um, and worst of all, where you do not know where you're going. And uh, so he, his theory is that, um, the, 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 that this is the experience of what he calls the abyss. But that is the experience of modernity for vast numbers of people in the world. The experience of the abyss. And I, my, I would then, make the um, leap to say that the art you're looking at is this kind of aesthetic intelligence that comes out of the experience of the abyss. So, in that, in that sense. so Caribbean, yes, but I can think, yeah. You've lost Elizabeth, anyway. <laughs> Do we uh, have any other questions? Thank you very much.
that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what they could.